Hi, everybody. I would like to welcome you to the Ethics in Research and Biotechnology Consortium series. This is a monthly series that brings together ethicists and researchers to talk about uh, ethics issues at the cutting edge of both biomedical research and biotechnology. My name is Insu Hian. I'm the host for this series. I'm a faculty member in, and the director of research ethics at Harvard Medical School's Center for Bioethics. And I'm also a professor of bioethics at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Um, so I would like to uh, just go over a few of the ground rules for submitting questions and uh, how you can be involved as an audience member. These are meant to be interactive sessions where we first present material to you, and then there's plenty of time for discussion and uh, interaction after the formal presentation. So just a reminder, this is being recorded and live streamed via Facebook. Um, the event video will be posted on the Center for Bioethics Facebook page and on YouTube pages if you want to go back and take a look at this again, or if you know other people who might be interested in this topic. You can submit questions at any time using the Q&A feature. Try not to use the chat function because we actually will, might miss your question if you put it into the uh, group chat. It's much better to put it into the Q&A feature. And uh, at the end of the pre formal presentation, we'll be selecting key questions from the Q&A. We probably won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll get to as many as we can. And uh, both Madeline Lancaster, our speaker today, and me will try to uh, answer as much as we can. If there are any technical issues along the way, just use the chat function for that and send a message to the panelists and staff who might be able to help you. And then, of course, we've got upcoming events in the series that you can find at the Bioethics at HMS website, um, shown at the bottom there. So with that, let me go ahead and introduce the speaker for today. Um, we have Dr. Madeline Lancaster. She's a group leader in the Cell Biology Division in the Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology, which is part of the Cambridge Biomedical Campus in Cambridge, UK. We're very lucky to have her speak to us about brain organoids. In fact, she pioneered the first human brain organoid research paper back in 2013, kickstarting this very dynamic and very interesting field. So let me turn it over now to Dr. Lancaster and um, she can get started with just saying a brief hello and starting with her presentation. Take it away. Yeah. So um, thank you. And uh, it's really a, a pleasure to be able to be here. Let me just uh, get my shared screen going. There we go. Good. Um, so yeah, it's really great to um, to be invited to to talk about brain organoids, how we're using them to advance COVID nineteen research, and also the ethical sur uh, questions surrounding brain organoids, especially as it pertains to things like consciousness. Um, it's it's I think it's quite nice to be here at the LMB actually because um, I don't know if everybody knows, but this is where Francis Crick got his start. And in fact, we have a, um, a, a chalkboard just outside my office that he signed. And um, you know, I'm reminded of that every time uh, we, we get on the topic of consciousness, just because then of course that became a, a main interest of his later in his life. Um, and so I'd like to think that he might be happy that somebody like me is working now at the LMB. Um, and so, um, yeah, so I'll just jump right into it. I want to first start by talking about uh, brain organoids and, and kind of what they are, and particularly sort of what the brain organoids are that, that my lab is using, because they're a little bit different from lab to lab. Um, and so before I get into brain organoids as well, I want to first just uh, talk about some of the really big questions actually that my lab is interested in and, and why we need brain organoids for these big questions. So one of the biggest questions really um, in neuroscience is uh, what is it about our brains that makes us special, that gives us our special cognitive capability and really makes us who we are? And so this is a, a, a question that has, you know, been of interest to philosophers and scientists alike for hundreds of years. And we still don't have the answer, of course, but we're getting there. We're, we're getting some, some hints now. And one thing uh, you know, that we now know is that, uh, for example, that we know now that there isn't uh, a particular part of the brain that makes us human. So for, for some time, it was thought that maybe there's uh, specific brain regions that don't exist in other animals, and that's just simply not true. So even regions of the brain that, that are important for um, 
for speech, for example, Broca's area and Wernicke's area, there are the equivalent regions in other uh, apes, for example. Um, and so the basic architecture, this basic architecture of having, you know, a cerebral cortex, a thalamus, a cerebellum, brainstem, all of these structures are present in all other mammals. Um, so there's not, there's not just, you know, there's not some brain region that makes us human. So if it's not that, um, could it be something a little bit more, um, uh, you know, uh, microscopic? So if we look inside the brain and we start looking at its um, architecture, we also see that there's no, you know, there's no human specific sort of architecture. Um, we all, all mammals, we all have this uh, gray matter uh, made up of the neuronal cell bodies around the outside. And then the white matter made up of all of their connections on the inside. And that's true of mice as well and, and other mammals. Um, and if you look a little bit more closely and you start really looking at the neurons, you see uh, a particular architecture where you have these beautiful neurons um, that are you know, organized in a sort of layered fashion. And this layering is the same as well. So across mammals, again, we have these six primary layers in the cortex. Um, they're a little bit more complex in the sense that there's sort of more neurons in each of these layers um, in, in primates and in humans. But there's no, you know, suddenly a new layer that exists in human, for example. So qualitatively, um, there doesn't really seem to be something different about the human brain. So what I mean is there's not some feature that exists that does not exist in other animals. But quantitatively, that's where we really see the differences. And so what I'm referring to here really is brain size and neuron number. So um, uh, our brains are, are very big just in general. Um, even you know if, if you wanna see a, a brain that starts to reach the size of ours, you need to, you need to start looking in really big animals, you know, like elephants and whales. Um, but we're not nearly as big as elephants and whales, and yet we have a really huge brain. So the best way to think about this is to think about how big is our brain um, for our body size. And that's what this uh, so-called encephalization quotient is communicating. And so without necessarily getting into it in too much detail, what this number is telling you is that our brains are around seven times larger than they would be expected to be for our body size. Whereas um, uh, gorillas, for example, you know, gorillas have quite large bodies. So although their brains are quite large, they are not um, that much enlarged compared to their body size as ours is. And on the contrary, mice, for example, actually have a smaller brain than you would expect for a body size that they have. And of course, brain size is related to, um, you know, cell, cellular makeup and the neurons being sort of the key computational units of the brain. We tend to focus on those. And so our brains have around 80 to 100 billion neurons. So it's been, it's often reported to be 86 billion simply because there's a, a very nice publication from Susanna Herculano Halsell where they actually counted the number of neurons. But this varies from individual to individual. So it's really more likely a range of 80 to 100. And instead in other um, apes, uh, we have about a third uh, the number of neurons. And also brain size is about the third, a third of the size of humans. Now, just to put this number in context, because it's, also, it's very difficult, I think, for our minds to really understand these kinds of huge numbers. So to put that into context, this 80 to 100 billion neurons, if you were to spread this out um, over the nine months of gestation and calculate how many neurons would need to be made per hour over nine months of gestation, you get 12 to 15 million neurons every single hour of that nine months of gestation in order to reach that huge number. So you're getting the equivalent of, you know, a uh, uh, basically, so a mouse cortex, an entire mouse cerebral cortex, adult mouse cerebral cortex, has 4 million neurons. So you're making uh, three of those every single hour, you know, entire uh, equivalent of an entire mouse cerebral cortex every single hour. 
So it's, it's really a huge number. And, and I want to sort of drive that point home because I'll be coming back to it quite a bit, I think. Um, and actually, um, I will come to it now if my slide will change. Just to briefly take a little foray into um, consciousness and just kind of you know open this up a little bit and then I'm sure we'll come back to it later. But um, on this topic of sort of the quantitative difference uh, you know in humans in the human brain compared with other animals, um, we don't we, we obviously don't have a good uh, definition of consciousness yet so and I won't even claim to have any idea about this myself. But one thing I think most of us can agree on is that consciousness is some sort of um, emergent property of a, of a highly complex brain. And it's related to cognitive capacity. So the higher the cognitive capacity, likely the higher the degree of consciousness. So we may never really have a good definition of consciousness. And so I'm sort of skeptical about whether it's even worth necessarily trying to define or to, to find consciousness in different organisms or in organoids for that matter. But at least we know it's related to cognitive capacity. And we can think about cognitive capacity and we can kind of measure that. And so, um, you know, we can, we, if we sort of put a number of animals on a scale here, you know, we, we think that cognitive capacity, uh, that there, is, there, is a, there, there are degrees of that cognitive capacity and humans are sort of at one end of the, of the spectrum and worms and flies would be over here. And then if you now look at the number of neurons, that matches really well with what we, you know, sort of understand to be cognitive capacity. And actually, I want to point out mice and birds here. So for a long time, you know, we know that birds can do some kind of complex things like, you know, song, uh, learning songs and such, but they weren't really thought to be, you know, conscious or to, to have more complex um, abilities. And recently it's been shown that they can make the same kinds of complex decisions that even primates can make. And actually, if you look at their brains, they have, and this is just for a songbird, corvids, which are very, very smart. So crows and magpies have around four times this number. Um, and so birds actually uh, are very smart. And in fact, you know, you see that they actually have more neurons than mice do. Um, so yeah, so I think the number of neurons really, it's this quantitative aspect that relates also to the degree of, of cognitive capability. And it's a bit like, you know, computers, right? You can, if you, if you have a really, really simple computer, basically just a calculator, it can only do a few simple calculations. But as you increase the computing capacity, the RAM the storage, the processing unit, you get more and more complex uh, abilities. And really, I probably should actually put this, even this gigantic supercomputer is probably still way down here on the spectrum if you wanted to draw a comparison to animals. We are still way ahead of, of the, even these guys. So, and again, it's just wrapping your mind around that huge number of neurons, I think, that we, it's really many magnitudes of difference that we're talking about. Um, so uh, now I'm taking a, a shift back to you know what uh, we do in my lab. So um, the the reason that we are interested in these questions, you know, in, in what makes our brains unique, is not just because it's very interesting, but also because uh, it has a lot of implications for human neurological conditions. Um, and actually, there are a huge number of people um, in the world who are suffering from mental, mental illnesses and other neurological conditions. So one in four people will actually be diagnosed with a mental health condition every single year. These are UK numbers, but they're actually highly similar in the United States as well. Um, and despite that high prevalence, mental health and neurological research doesn't receive nearly as much funding as other areas like cancer. And one of the reasons for that is because it's, it's a bit of a chicken and egg issue because, because they're, they're, it's, it, these conditions have been very difficult to treat, they receive even less money because the success rate is so bad. So in, um, in the area of neuroscience, there are the, the attrition rate for new drugs is higher than any other area. Um, so basically, it's very high failure rate for, for developing new drugs to treat these conditions. And that's because of something that some people have called the clinical trial cliff, which is where um, quite a lot of drugs have successfully made it through preclinical trials, 
and have cured uh, various neurological conditions in mice, for example. So spinal cord injury, for example, there have been drugs developed that have been able to, to, to make mice walk again after spinal cord injury. But when they take them to the clinic, unfortunately they fail every time. And the reason is because of a, they, either because they lack efficacy, so they just don't work in humans, or because of toxicity, they cause toxic side effects. And this is because, uh, I think, because the human brain is unique. And so when you use these animal models to develop drugs, you know, they don't, they're not applicable to, to the problems in, in humans. And so that suggests we need a, a human model that we can use to, to treat this huge number of, of suffering individuals, really. Um, and so that's where, uh, brain organoids or cerebral organoids come in. So these, these are, this is a method that I developed when I was a postdoc in Jurgen Knobluch's lab in, uh, came in Vienna, uh, in Austria. And um, we, so this, this method has been around for a little while. We've uh, improved it and made some modifications. And what I'm showing you in this uh, schematic on the left is kind of, kind of a schematic of, of the current method that we use in my lab. So uh, we use a bit of bioengineering. We can make um, we can make organoids from uh, from cells that that can be made from you know any individual really. You just need a, a sample that contains live live cells, and we can reprogram them and make these pluripotent stem cells, which are basically stem cells that can give rise to any cell in the body, and we then uh, sort of guide them towards a brain fate, a neural fate. Um, so what we end up with are these, these tissues that have these sort of little um, outgrowths, what we call lobes. And each one of these lobes is essentially equivalent to uh, the cerebral um, cortex here that you see in a human embryo. So this is a section through a developing human embryo. This is a, sort of a schematic of what that looks like at that stage, uh, around that stage. You can see the cerebral cortex is really large in humans. It really expands outward. Um, and so each one of these little sort of uh, buds here or lobes uh, is equivalent to that. And if you section through it, you can also hopefully uh, see the similarity that I'm talking about. So you can see each one of these lobes has this fluid filled space here. And I forgot to mention, so these are, we've filled these with a blue dye. So you can actually see that fluid filled space there. Um, and when you compare with a mouse uh, fetal cortex, you see the same organization where you have the fluid filled ventricle, um, just like here. And um, in our organoids, we, we see the same sort of architecture as well with these stem cells on the inside and neurons around the outside. So the, the difference here, of course, is that we have several of these lobes. And obviously in an actual embryo, you would just have two cortical hemispheres. Um, so we tend to look at each of these lobes in isolation and study that as a sort of little cerebral cortical unit. Um, Helen, I have a question for you at this point. It's, I think it's fascinating that cerebral organoids in the human um, recapitulate the fetal stages of brain development. So it kind of starts from very early development onwards. And I know that you're aware of a paper published about a year ago by Alison Motri's team at UC San Diego, where they very controversially claim that they, they observed electrical signaling in their more mature brain organoid models that seem to be very similar to what, what one might expect in premature infant brains. So I'm wondering if you have thoughts about, like, is that the best way to think about that data? Uh, what are your thoughts on that kind of, um, that kind of paper? Yeah, so, um... Yeah, so we're, we're, doing, we're also doing more and more looking at the electrophysiology. So what they were looking at was the electrophysiology, the neuronal activity, and we're also doing that in our lab, looking at our organoids in that way. Um, but I think there's a couple of things. So one, uh, you, you, we know in science that when you compare uh, data that's collected in a different way, um, you know, there are issues with that basically there are issues with comparing data that's collected in different ways. So um, the, the data from uh, preterm babies is EEG data. And so what that is, is an electrode on the skull. And what it's really measuring is the combined activity of millions of neurons, really millions. There's a reason you can't do an EEG on a mouse because a mouse doesn't have enough neurons 
for, for one of those electrodes to be able to record the activity. So, and then just the, the, the way the recording is done is different. And instead in the, in the organoids, they're, do, they're recording um, using what's called a multi-electrode array, which it's also electrodes, but these are electrodes that are placed right next to the neurons and are, are receiving information from individual neurons. So the difference is recording from huge populations of neurons in a, in a human brain and recording from a few neurons in an organoid and then trying to draw similarities there. So that's one major caveat with that study is comparing different data collected in very different ways. It, it's, I just don't think it's comparable. Um, the only way really to do it would be to implant electrodes into babies' brains, but nobody's gonna do that. So let's just leave it, you know. Um, I think probably it'd be more, in, more um, relevant to compare with mouse data, for example, which is collected in the same sort of way. And in that sense, I do think that the electrical activity that they're recording is quite intriguing. It's quite mature in a sense. So it is, you do see uh, quite mature activities, but as I think I'll come to as well, just seeing neurons become mature is not enough to say that you have a human brain there. Oh, that's great. I really appreciate your perspective on that because I think the temptation is to leap too far forward in your conclusions based on limited data, or as you suggested, maybe uh, questionable data comparisons, and then uh, to stir up a lot of controversy either in the bioethics field or among regulators over brain organoids. It's very important to have ethics and analysis grounded in the actual science and good methodology. So thank you for that. Okay, so I'm not going to interrupt any further. Go ahead and uh, proceed. <laughs> well, okay, please do interrupt me though if you want to. And so I think there's yeah, there's definitely places. So. Um, I mentioned that I would also, I just wanted to also mention a little bit um, sort of how the, the, the organoids that we're working with kind of fit in the grander scheme of different organoids that are out there and other, other systems that are out there as well. So there, there are, um, you know, we, we are not the first to be growing, uh, you know, neurons in a dish. And actually, you know, people have been growing human neural stem cells in a 2D culture like this you know, in a dish for over probably a couple of decades now. Um, and, and we can learn a lot from those neurons. And actually those neurons can become very mature. Um, you can see quite mature activity there, neurons connecting with each other. And, and, uh, and we can use that to learn something about human neurons. But the, the issue is that the neurons are sort of disorganized. They're not, they're not um, you know, exhibiting the kind of architecture that you would actually see in a brain. You know, our brains have a particular architecture. It's not just a hundred billion neurons randomly connected with each other. They have to be connected in a particular way. And so um, while this is a great system to look at individual neurons and how human neurons mature, it's not so good for looking at networks and, and more complex kinds of behaviors. So, um, uh, this, the field has been moving towards more, you know, increasingly complex systems and these cerebral organoids that we work with um, are much more complex. They exhibit a variety of different brain regions often. I have to say that our newer protocols, the one I just showed you in the last slide, is actually focused more just on the forebrain, so in mainly the, the cerebral cortex, um, but we can make organoids that contain a variety of different brain regions. Uh, but it, the, the, the issue is that you start to sort of um, lose control a little bit over what brain regions are made where. So you get kind of a disorganized, um, you know, blob of tissue where you have like, you know, multiple cortexes, for example, and then maybe, you know, like one retinal region and then maybe, you know, a, a thalamic region, for example. And of course, in vivo, in the actual brain, you would you would really just have you know, two cerebral hemispheres organized in the right way with a thalamus and you know, two eyes and one cerebellum. And we might have five cerebellums in one of these things. So if th in that way, they're, they're quite disorganized. But we can look at each individual brain region and actually get a lot of information. So one of the analogies that I draw is sort of, um, it's a bit like if you had an airplane and Remember those things? Remember airplanes? <laughs> it's a bit like if we had an airplane, we took all of 
pieces of the airplane off and kind of put them back together in a very jumbled fashion. So we'd have one wing on top of the fuselage, uh, you know, a propeller at the back, the wheels on the top, the engine sitting in the middle somewhere. And that's, that, that, that plane would never fly. So it's not going to be functional. Uh, just like an organoid is not going to be able to think. But we can study each of those components in isolation and under understand something about them. So we can understand something about the wing, about the propeller, oh, it turns, you know, that kind of thing. And so the same is true here in the organoids. We, we sort of focus in on those regions individually to learn something. Um, so, yeah, so this sort of just shows you some of that complexity. This is a movie through a cleared organoid where uh, we're imaging each, what you're seeing here is the individual cell bodies. And then in, we've traced out these ventricles and you can actually see how they're interconnected with each other. So it doesn't look like a brain, but you can see individual brain regions and you can sort of look at how they're also you know, interconnected. Now, um, more recently, we've also been uh, interested in, in looking at neuronal maturation and activity. And so that's what I was also mentioning. Um, but one of the issues that we've uh, you know, faced with organoids is that um, when cultured in three dimensions like that, they become, they become big. Now, when I say big, I mean probably the size of a, of a, a, a very small pea. <laughs> um, so they're still pretty small by, by most you know, general public sort of standards. For a biologist like myself, where we're always used to looking at everything under a microscope, they're really big. But I, they, like I say, they're, they're pretty small. <laughs> um, but still, they're, they're too big to, um, uh, to get to basically to, to uh, survive and grow without vasculature. So they have no blood vessels. And because they have no blood vessels, they have no uh, blood supply or oxygen being supplied to the inside. And what that means is you get a lot of cell death. So in order to overcome that issue, we've now started doing something called air liquid interface slice culture. So we take our organoids, there's my mouse, there it is. So we take these organoids and um, before they become too big that they start to die, we, we cut thick sections. We just, we use a, a blade to cut them into these thick sections. And then we put them on this filter where you have the nutrient bath underneath and the air above and they get the oxygen and the nutrients that way. And what that leads to is a really nice maturation of neurons. So this is a stain for neurons. And so in red, you're actually looking at all the axons. So the, the, the processes that neurons extend through the white matter to connect with other neurons. And in green are some individual cells that we've just specifically labeled. Um, and what you can see is these individual cells that are sending these long processes over to the other side of the organoid. So we get these really long, long range projections. And in our brains, we know that the, these long range projections are very, very important for transmitting information you know, from one hemisphere to the other, for example. And so we can see, again, we can see these really long range projections, um, not only within the organoid, so projecting from one side to the other, but also leaving the organoid. And actually, uh, some, if we provide a, a, a target tissue, so what I'm showing you here is actually um, uh, an explant of a mouse spinal cord uh, from an embryonic mouse. So we basically dissected out the spinal cord of the mouse and we've left a bit of muscle attached to the spinal cord. So a bit of the back muscle attached. And so this is, that's what this is. And we've just placed it next to one of these air liquid interface cultures. And what you're seeing here are human axons. So this in, in, in magenta here is staining specifically just human cells. And you're seeing these nice long axons projecting into the mouse tissue. And the reason we put mouse spinal cord there is because one of the long range projections that's so important in humans is what's called the corticospinal tract. These are motor neurons from the cortex that actually project down into the spinal cord. And those are the neurons that control movement. They tell you to move your arm or you know, blink or you know, move your mouth and talk. Um, and so these are the neurons that are actually triggering those movements. So what this allows us to do then by having this mouse tissue and the muscle attached is to see if these projections are functional, to see if they're actually sending out information. 
So what we've done here is we've actually uh, used an electrode to stimulate only the human tissue here and then watch the mouse tissue. So this is the mouse muscle tissue when we stimulate. And so this is just a trace of the contractions that you're going to see. And this is while we're giving a, a series of pulses of stimulation. And what you'll see if it will play is the, the muscle tissue contracting uh, once we trigger those stimulations. This is just a, um, a trace of that. So the, each little, if I can find my mouse again, there we go. Each little um, uh, line up here is, is showing you one of the stimulations we've given and you can see these, these contractions in response. So that tells us that these neurons and these organoids can be functional and actually trigger muscle contractions. Um, now, more recently, we've, we've started looking at um, other important functions within the forebrain. One of the regions of the forebrain that doesn't really get very much attention is what's called the choroid plexus. And this is a tissue inside the brain. It's very deep inside the brain. And it actually generates the cerebrospinal fluid. So cerebrospinal fluid is this really important nutrient-rich nutrient fluid that surrounds and bathes the brain. And for a long time, it was thought to just be there to sort of provide some kind of cushioning so that every time you hit your head, your brain doesn't hit into your skull. But it's much more than that. It's providing nutrients, uh, certain vitamins that, that aren't provided by the blood. And it's also helping to clean out the brain from toxic byproducts of all of this high metabolism that's going on in our brains and also clear out aggregates, things, that, things like um, uh, A-beta, the protein that actually aggregates in Alzheimer's disease. So the way I kind of think about cerebrospinal fluid is that it's a bit like the, the um, water and plumbing system of your house. Um, it's providing much needed uh, liquid and it's also helping clear out um, all of the waste. And if something goes wrong there, it's very bad news. So imagine if all of the toilets in your house um, clogged and you, know, you couldn't get a plumber in, very bad news. So, um, we were very interested then in, in seeing whether our organoids could also such, shed some light on this tissue and also, you know, help us um, learn something more about the cerebrospinal fluid because there really is very little known actually in humans. Like I say, it just hasn't really gotten much attention. It's not the most sexy part of the brain. You know, when you talk about plumbing, it doesn't sound that exciting, but it's so important. Um, and so to do this, um, a, a postdoc in my lab, Laura Pellegrini, she developed a method that modifies our existing brain organoid protocol and generates these beautiful, these beautiful choroid plexus organoids. So they look just like the actual choroid plexus that you see in the actual human brain. And they make these really large fluid filled sacs, fluid that looks a lot like cerebrospinal fluid. So we actually extracted the fluid from within those and did something called mass spec. Uh, so to look at the different kinds of proteins that are being secreted there. And we found that uh, there was a really huge overlap between the, the, the fluid that we're seeing in these organoids and actual um, uh, cerebrospinal fluid from actual human beings. And um, so that suggests that this, these organoids are making a, a CSF-like fluid. Um, and part of generating uh, cerebrospinal fluid is also uh, par part of the, the, the role of this choroid plexus is also acting as a barrier. So because the CSF has free access to the brain, it can flow in and out between glia and neurons. Um, it, it, like the rest of the brain, it needs to be protected by a very selective barrier. So our brains um, are, are sealed off from the rest of the body. Um, drugs, toxic compounds, pathogens are not able to enter the brain, not even our immune cells. So, you know, T cells and B cells and such are not able to enter the brain. And that's because of this highly protective barrier. And the CSF has to be protected by the same kind of barrier because otherwise anything that could get into the CSF can get into the brain. And so indeed, when we tested the barrier surrounding these tissues, we found a really selective barrier that was able to prevent entry of even small molecules like dopamine. So we know that dopamine doesn't enter our brains but it would allow L-DOPA, which is a precursor of dopamine, 
it did allow that to cross. And that's exactly what you also see in vivo in the actual brain. And in fact, L-DOPA is given to patients who need um, uh, dopamine therapy uh, uh, you know, treatment. Right. Um, so just now looking at sort of what we're using these different organoids to, to model. Um, so one of the first things that uh, brain organoids were used for and are being used for is to model human neurological conditions. So the idea is you can take uh, cells from an individual with a condition, you can reprogram them to induce pluripotent stem cells, make organoids, and then compare them to the control and, and see how they're different. So we did this in, in our first paper with patients from, uh, cells from a patient with microcephaly. So many of you may have heard of microcephaly because of the Zika virus um, uh, uh, epidemic, um, but this was a genetic form of microcephaly. So this patient had a, a mutation and we were able to generate organoids and compare to um, control. And what we found is that the organoids were overall smaller than the patient, uh, than, the, than, the, than, the, than the healthy control. And we could actually then use the organoids to understand why. And what we found is that the neural stem cells, the stem cells within these tissues that are gonna give rise to neurons were becoming depleted too soon and they weren't being maintained so that they could make more neurons. And I mentioned Zika virus. And in fact, indeed, this was one of the, this has been one of the real sort of big success stories I'd say of brain organoids um, because uh, they've been used by a number of labs to uh, look at how Zika virus causes microcephaly and have been, you know, and, and organoids have shown that the reason is because this virus infects the, the neural stem cells and, uh, and similarly depletes those neural stem cells. And so now they're even being used to develop um, drug therapies to try to treat th this condition. Madeline, um, this is fascinating because you're now able to model human neurological disorders using an original donor sample. So you can model uh, either the development of a disorder or even use healthy controls to compare these disorders up against. I'm wondering if there's any concern in the near future maybe about what we might call a developmental incidental finding. Because in the course of genetic sample research or even a brain scan research, there's this whole uh, problem that arises that the investigator may see something incidental to what they were looking for that may have health related consequences and may even be actionable by the patient themselves. And then the question is, do they need to return these findings to the clinician and to the patient? I can imagine that there could be cases here where uh, it wouldn't be evident from a, a genetic analysis of the person, but maybe if, even if it's a healthy control, that you would have to see manifestations of something irregular during the, uh, the, the developmental phases of, of your model. Do you think we're just still too far away from that becoming an issue, the issue of developmental incidental findings and what obligations people like you may have in the course of your research? Yeah, I don't know. I think that's a really interesting question. That's definitely a new one that I've not actually got before. And I think it's a really, I do think it's an important question to start thinking about. I think it is probably still early, but um, and usually, you know, like for the, for example, for, for these, these human neurological conditions that we've been modeling, these are, you know, we know the patient has a condition. And so we are therefore using the organized to try to understand the right. molecular mechanism, you know, leading to that condition. But, you know, it could be that you get, con like you say, control individuals, and then you find something that you weren't expecting. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd say probably not so much for developmental conditions because those will be obvious in the patients. And so you'll already know that when you get the cells. But maybe for something, maybe for, for example, for neuro neurodegenerative conditions, mm -hmm. you know, later onset conditions. Right. People are beginning to use organoids to model Alzheimer's, for example, and have been able to see, you know, um, in, in, so um, neurodegeneration actually is one area where brain organoids have a lot of potential because, um, Mouse models of neurodegeneration are, there's issues with them. So t you tend to have to, um, you have to introduce a lot of mutations before you start seeing neurodegeneration, much more than what you see in patients. So we know that in human beings, if they have a mutation in presenilin one, for example, they will generate familial Alzheimer's disease. But in a mouse, if you introduce the same mutation, you don't see, you don't see the, the, neuro, neuro, the neurodegenerative effects. You have to add on top of it other mutations and other mutations when you finally start to see something. So clearly something different going on there. Now in 2D cultures of human neurons, people have also started looking at this and they start to see some features, but the classic 
um, uh, pathology that defines these conditions, which is the, the, the tangles and the plaques. You never see both of those together in any of the models so far, but organoids and, and neurons in 3D, for some reason, the three-dimensional conformation, they have been able to see the pathology you see in patients. So now that we know we can see that in organoids, the question becomes, yeah, if I go and make organoids from a control individual who's maybe 30 years old, let's say young, and I see that, mm -hmm. do I need to go and inform that person that they have an increased risk, uh, an increased likelihood of developing neurodegenerative disease? Yeah, I don't know. I'd, I'd say take a page from genetics and, and, and follow their example there. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we'll see what the future holds, but as these models get more and more accurate and, and informative clinically, I think uh, there really is a possibility as you suggested for these control groups. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, right. So let's move to um, COVID now. So one of the reasons why I told you all about the, the choroid plexus organoids is also because it leads into this COVID work that we got into. So this, we started becoming interested in COVID and in particular in the virus causing COVID, the SARS-CoV-2, um, because of the increasing reports of neurological manifestations. So this is a poster that was um, put together by um, uh, at Emory. Um, and just, I think it's a nice kind of just visual representation of the variety of different kinds of neurological manifestations seen. This was back in April already. Um, and of course, since then, we, we know of even more um, neurological symptoms. Um, and some of these symptoms are, are probably not necessarily directly a, a result of, of, a, of a neurological problem, but rather a, a side effect. So for example, stroke is probably more likely an issue of, of um, you know, uh, uh, problems with vasculature. Um, but, uh, you know, since, since April, we've also learned about patients who are exhibiting, for example, um, uh, psychosis, um, depression and anxiety, confusion, this so-called brain fog, and now, of course, long COVID. Um, these, these people who, who, you know, we didn't even realize that they had these kinds of symptoms because they didn't end up in hospital. We're learning now there's a huge number of people that actually have long-term complications of uh, COVID-19, including neurological complications. So we became interested in trying to understand uh, where or why some of these neurological complications might be arising and whether it's because, um, whether this virus might actually um, infect the brain. So we figured organoids would be a good model to look at. So the first thing we did was just to take our um, organoids and to look at, uh, look at the individual cells within the organoids by doing something called single cell RNA-seq. So what we're doing here is we're taking our organoids, we're breaking them apart into single cells, and then we're sequencing each one of those cells to identify what those cells are based on the proteins that they're making. Um, and so by doing that, we can define different cells and, and say what they are, and we can also say, what are they making? And one of the things we wanna know what they're making is this ACE2, which is the main receptor for SARS-CoV-2, and this, this gene called TEMPRAS2, which is a co-entry factor. So these are necessary for entry of this virus into cells. And so if a cell expresses these factors, it's likely that it could be susceptible to this virus. And what we found is that these uh, factors seem to be present in certain cells of the organoids, but not all the cells. So we see it highest in all of the choroid plexus, that's what the CHP stands for, in the choroid plexus cells of our organoids, but not in the neural cells of our organoids. So that suggests maybe it could infect choroid plexus. And in fact, actually that matches very nicely with in vivo data. So this is data taken from a database called the Allen Brain Atlas. Uh, where we're looking at ACE2 levels across different brain regions. These are just uh, ordered by the regions expressing the highest levels of ACE2 and choroid plexus here is expressing the highest levels. So this suggests that maybe the choroid plexus, this CSF producing part of the brain might be susceptible to this virus. So to test that, we started out by using what's called a pseudovirus. So this is basically a, um, a safe virus. Uh, uh, so not the actual SARS-CoV-2, but another safe virus, what's called a lentivirus. And then all we do is um, 
put on the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So you might've heard about the spike protein because it's the protein that all these new vaccines are targeting. So that's the protein of the virus that actually then binds to those um, entry factors, that ACE2 and that TEMPRS2. And that's what actually then triggers viral entry. So when we put spike protein on a pseudovirus like this, we can look at what cell types this, uh, the spike protein um, is able to infect. And indeed, what we can see is uh, infection of um, cells of the choroid plexus, of these choroid plexus organoids. And the way we know that is because the virus that we put in there is also carrying with it a green fluorescent protein. So we can just see that those cells must have been infected with the virus. Now, interestingly, if we do the same thing on cortical tissues of our organoids, we don't see any infection at all. But we do see infection if we use, instead of the spike protein pseudovirus, we instead use a lentivirus that carries um, an entry protein that, that, can, that can bind to any cell type. So it's not selective at all. And that then does infect. So we know then that this, that this, is, a, this, is, a, this is a positive control. So basically what we're seeing here is that we know the system works and our virus is working here. It's just that the spike protein is not recognizing cells of the cortex. Now that could be because maybe <clears throat> for whatever reason, the way that we've designed those experiments, maybe the pseudovirus is not really replicating what the live SARS-CoV-2 is doing. So to test that, we teamed up with a group of virologists here at the LMB who were starting to work with live SARS-CoV-2 and actually put live SARS-CoV-2 on some of our organoids. And for this experiment, we actually took organoids that had a mixed identity. So these are organoids that have choroid plexus uh, regions along with cortical regions. So this is very nice because we have the tissues together and we can put the virus on and see where does the virus preferentially infect. And so here we're staining for the spike protein of the virus and you can see that it clearly infects only the choroid plexus. So the choroid plexus here is the white cells because of this marker HTR2C, which specifically marks choroid plexus um, and does not infect the neural tissue here. HUCD is a neuronal marker. And then in blue is all the cell, cell type, all the different cells. And, uh, and even if we leave the virus on for a long time, we still don't see any specific uh, infection of neurons. Um, so the, yeah, so it seems to only infect choroid plexus cells. And it also, we found that when we infect choroid plexus organoids, we can see a productive infection, meaning that there's replication of the virus. So the virus actually goes up over time. So that suggests choroid plexus is not only susceptible, but is also, also represents a, um, a productive um, uh, you know, cell type that's able to, to replicate more and more of this virus. Um, we also, you know, did a variety of other experiments where we, um, you know, put, uh, put the virus only on cortical tissues where they don't have any uh, of this choroid plexus. We thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe the choroid plexus is more susceptible and it's kind of acting like, like a sink, like it's sucking up all the virus and none of the virus can infect the, the neurons. But when we do that, we still don't see any specific um, uh, infection of cortical uh, tissues. The only times that we could see any infection of cortical tissues is if we um, increased the amount of virus at least 10 times and left it on for at least two days, then we could see one or two neurons being infected, but it was very minimal. I mean, it's hard to even show a picture of that. So it's, uh, it's, it's, we really don't think that neurons are very, or at least neurons in organoids are very susceptible to this virus. Now, what does the virus do to the choroid plexus? Well, I talked about how important the barrier is that the choroid plexus is, is protecting the brain and the CSF. And it turns out that this virus, when it infects this choroid plexus, we see a breakdown of the barrier. So this marker here, this Clauden 5, is marking, basically outlining the, the connections between cells. And the cells have to make these very, very tight contacts between them. It's almost like glue, so that they don't let anything uh, pass. Um, but when we have this, um, this virus, you can see these connections are broken down and it becomes leaky. In fact, we can actually see fluid leak out of the organoids. So we can actually measure the fluid inside the organs. We can see it's dropping in these guys. And then it's actually um, uh, diluting the protein that's outside of the organoids. So basically what we found is that um, 
that, that core and plexus cells here that are generating the cerebrospinal fluid of the brain are susceptible to this virus and that it's, it leads to a breakdown of the barrier here. And that's, uh, that's important because, um, not only because, you know, then that would allow virus in, um, but actually I think probably more concerning than that would be actually the entry of other things that are not supposed to be getting into the brain. Things like immune cells and inflammatory cytokines that would lead to a very broad sort of neuroinflammation. Um, like I say, the brain is normally supposed to be highly protected from the immune system and from toxic compounds in the blood. When you have a breakdown of this barrier, you know, you start getting T cell, activated T cells and macrophages going into the brain and start in attacking neurons themselves. And I think that's probably more concerning than the virus entering necessarily, because as we've shown, we don't think the virus really has too much tropism for, for at least cortical neurons. And rather, um, I think that the idea that, that neuroinflammation might be a major factor here also fits with the kinds of phenotypes that we see in patients, because this kind of brain fog and confusion and the actual um, um, you know, in, inflammation that's actually also seen in the brain uh, of some of these patients uh, fits very well with that. I also should state that the, the um, blood vessels here of the choroid plexus, so unlike the blood vessels inside the rest of the brain, so the blood vessels in the rest of the brain are themselves protected by a very tight barrier, the blood-brain barrier. But in the choroid plexus, blood vessels are really leaky and they're leaky on purpose because the choroid plexus has to take stuff from the blood and make CSF. But that also means that the virus, if it gets into the blood, would have very easy access to these choroid plexus cells. So probably not necessarily so common in the mi more mildly affected patients, but in patients where they have viremia, so where they actually have virus getting into the blood, then this may be more of a concern. Um, okay, so I will just switch gears now and go back to this kind of big question about what is so special about our brains and how we're trying to use brain organoids to understand some of that. Um, and this will kind of bring us full circle back to some of those questions about, about you know, what makes us human and, and consciousness and such. So we thought that organoids could give us a unique uh, insight into this because, um, you know, it's impossible actually to study the brains really of our closest living relatives, the other apes. They're highly endangered species. Um, they are protected. We don't do experiments on chimpanzees anymore. Um, you can't, you know, you can't, for example, get a chimpanzee embryo and look at its brain as, a, you know, and even just a postmortem. There's, there's no examples of that. So we don't even really know, for example, what a gorilla brain looks like in vivo. Uh, I mean, in, in during development. Um, so we, there's still a lot of questions about what's really human specific. Um, so organoids give us a, a unique, a unique uh, uh, window into this because we can make organoids from any cell type we can, because we can reprogram them. So we've been getting cells from different um, apes from, from zoos. So these are, these are basically samples that are taken for, because the animal needs to undergo some sort of veterinary practice or you know, has to have a blood test or something. And then they have leftover blood, they would have just thrown it away, they give it to us, and we are able to reprogram those cells and generate pluripotent stem cells and make organoids. Um, and so the animal isn't harmed at all, and we're able to learn something here. And so we're making organoids from different species. I'm going to focus on the, on the ape uh, for this part, and, uh, and then comparing them, looking at you know, how they look different. So um, these are just some of the examples. We have a number of different cell lines from different individuals. Um, but what we find is that uh, chimpanzee and gorilla um, organoids, first of all, they look beautiful. We're able to make beautiful organoids just like we can with human cells. But interestingly, and you can see, sorry, you can see these nice lobes, just like we see with the human, these nice cortical lobes. But interestingly, the overall size of these organoids tends to be a little bit smaller than the human. Um, and it's not a huge difference, and I wouldn't expect it to be a huge difference because after all, chimpanzees and gorillas actually do have quite large brains. Um, it's just that our brain is about three times larger. 
So um, what we decided to do was to look at earlier stages and try to find out when this size difference first appears. And it turns out that it actually appears really, really early when the neural stem cells, so these are, the, the, they, they haven't even started making neurons. The neural stem cells here are just expanding. They're just multiplying and increasing their numbers. And what we find is that in the human organoids, they seem to be expanding in a sort of a different way. They look different. These tissues look different. They have bigger spaces on the inside, these fluid filled lumens, the spaces on the inside are bigger. And this is just quantified here. You can see these are bigger than in the other apes. And so the, it turns out that the reason that those, those um, uh, lobes are a different shape is because the cells are a different shape. It turns out that while these cells are expanding, um, in humans, they have a more sort of like a column shape, so it's called columnar epithelial shape. And you can see here they're on, the, on their um, contacts here on the inside look pretty similar in width to their outside, but in the ape, they're really thin on these inside regions. Um, and you can see that even better when we do a stain for what's called ZO1. So this is a, a marker that, that goes around the outside of the, of the cell, just at that, just at this, this side here. And then we can look at them uh, on face. So we can actually you know, look at them all sitting next to each other. And we can see that in the ape, uh, these connections between cells are smaller. So they're just, the, the cells are much more thinned out. Um, and then what we see is that in both humans and apes, the, the cell shape changes over time, but in humans, the cell shape change is slower than in other apes. So without getting into too many of the details, basically what we've identified is a new sort of uh, cell stage here during development, something we're calling transitioning neuroepithelial cells. So these are these neuroepithelial, these are, these, are, these are the stem cells that are going to give rise to all the different cell types of the, of the brain. And um, in, in non-human apes, they, we see a change in their cell shape before we see that change in cell shape in humans. And simply because of a change in cell shape and a delay in that change in cell shape, humans then have slightly increased numbers of those neural stem cells, those progenitors that are going to give rise to all the neurons. And because they have an increased number of those founder stem cells, then once they switch to making neurons, you just have more to work with, so you make more neurons. And so that will lead to a general increase in all of the different neuron types. And in fact, that's exactly what you see in the, in the adult brains when you compare them. The, the fact is that human brains are around three times larger and all neuron types are about three times increased uh, compared with um, other apes. And so um, basically it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of timing. By delaying this transition in humans, we see a slight increase in the number of progenitors that leads to a pretty dramatic effect then later on in terms of number of neurons. And this whole process is really delayed when you compare with something like rodents where the whole thing happens in a matter of hours. And in humans and apes, it takes over a week. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's all about timing here. So with that, I'll just thank uh, some of the people in the lab that uh, did the work that I showed you. So I mentioned uh, Laura, she did the work on the choroid plexus organoids and the SARS-CoV-2 work. Um, Sylvia did the work on, the, on evolution and Stefano uh, uh, worked on the um, air liquid interface work that I showed you. Thanks. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. So clear and you covered a lot of ground. Let me just, uh, as we're gathering our questions for the Q&A portion, let me just start it off by asking the following question. It was fascinating work, beautiful work you did with the, uh, the plexus and, and the infection routes with COVID. Do you think this could lead to any interventions or strategies? Uh, and what would that look like? Yeah. So I, I don't, I think it's probably too early to say interventions or strategies, but I think what it does suggest is that we really need to do more, um, more investigations of patients themselves. In particular, I'd, I'd like to see um, some investigation of CSF samples. Um, it's not common necessarily to take CSF samples, but I think that we should start looking into that, particularly given this increasing rate of neurological conditions, um, because we need to understand whether, you know, is there really, um, well, first of all, 
is uh, viral presence in the CSF a common finding or not? We still don't really know. There's a few papers that say, yes, we see it, but a lot of papers that say, no, we don't see it. Um, and so I think we just need more information there. And secondly, um, even in the absence of virus, are you getting uh, an, an um, abnormal inflammation there? Are you getting things like T cells and macrophages and inflammatory cytokines entering the brain when they shouldn't be? And that would then hopefully give us some insight into whether there is a breakdown there in vivo, you know, in the actual patients, and whether we should start considering things like um, um, uh, immune modulation, so, so dampening down the immune response using things like steroids. Um, it may be that some of the treatments that are already being used for for other parts of the disorder, you know, other, the lung inflammation that you're seeing will also help with the neuroinflammation. But we need to understand that because you also, you don't wanna actually um, hurt the patient. So maybe you need to have inflammation. Maybe the virus is, you know, still present and needs to be killed off by your immune system. So I think we also, we just need to understand a little bit more from actual patients. Thank you. So I'm going to turn it over to my uh, graduate student, Christina, who's going to be moderating uh, the questions that have come in. So take it away, Christina. What, what's our first question? Well, thank you, first of all. What an amazing um, presentation and the applications of the research that you've pioneered are tremendous. So it's, it's yeah. delightful to have you here. Um, along the lines of COVID and the work um, that, you know, the potential application there, there are two questions. One is whether or not you know whether Pfizer or Moderna or any of the other um, companies that have been doing work in the area of vaccine have relied on any of the organoid information or research that you have? And what ethical issues might you see going forward specifically with respect to COVID-19 research? Yeah, so I don't know of any I don't know, for, certainly not from the immune, uh, sorry, the, 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 um, the vaccine development perspective. I don't think organoids are necessarily gonna give you much information when it comes to that, but uh, more for probably for the, the treatment of patients who already have COVID or who, who get COVID despite ha having a vaccine maybe. Um, there, I think, um, then organoids might give, a, give us some insight. I don't personally know about, I'm not interacting, for example, with any um, pharmaceutical companies. I hope that they are reading the papers that we are putting out there. I do hope that that at least is, is happening and that they may be able to use some of these organoid systems as well. Um, we are making these methods widely available and accessible. There will even be a, a kit that people can buy, that, that companies can buy for making brain organoids and for making choroid plexus organoids in particular. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for these companies and things to come in and be able to use these models, um, definitely. From an ethics perspective, um, ethics surrounding COVID-19 and organoids, I, you know, I don't know, I guess, I mean, I think the, when it comes to patient modeling, and, and that's basically what we're talking about, sort of modeling a disease here, right? Um, I think that we obviously have an ethical duty to provide the findings as quickly as possible. So we're trying to do that. And obviously using things like BioArchive and putting, so we put this out on BioArchive as soon as we could. Um, and, uh, and, and then, you know, publishing it as quickly as possible and open access. Um, and then, when I think about you know modeling patient conditions, usually I think this comes more at, into into play when you're actually taking cells from patients. So in our case, we're just we're using a, an established human embryonic stem cell line, you know that that's from an individual that doesn't exist, you know. So it's it, there is no sort of. But if you take patients, if you take cell lines from a, a living patient, I think there there that is also something we we should be talking about more probably in the, particularly in the brain organoid field about telling patients or asking patients if they're comfortable with us making brain organoids from their cell lines. Because a lot of times we, we just do these patient consent forms that are really broad and don't really specify what it is we're gonna be doing with them. Um, and I guess they write them on purpose like that, but it's a little bit, you know, I don't, I think, you know, I think it's better to tell the patients and have them decide whether they're comfortable with it. So that yeah, leads to an interest. And yeah, many people will, will agree with you on that one. 
And, and it leads to an interesting question, I think, um, about asking for donor permission to use biomaterials for brain organized re organoid research if the future prospect of such research is entirely unknown at this stage. So how can you create the parameters and set them forth so that informed consent is accurate and um, not encroached going forward? Yeah, and that's the problem with a lot of these kinds of things is, um, you know, a lot of times the, the patient consent that we have on, on IPS cell lines, for example, that we have in the lab, some of these IPS cell lines have been around for, you know, well, as long as IPS cells have been around. So, you know, over 10 years sometimes. And 10 years ago, brain organoids didn't exist. So when patient consent was obtained, this wasn't even on anybody's radar. Why would you even include it? Um, so I think there's also a question of whether should we try to go back to some of those patients and ask them if they're comfortable with this. Um, in the future, I think we should start telling patients what we may do with these cell lines. And it might be that repositories that are, that are establishing these databases, these, these, these sets of cells, could have in their patient consent, you know, are you comfortable with, and then you could have a number of different things. Human embryo-like uh, tissues as well, for example, I think a lot of people might not necessarily want to have their cells used for that, but maybe they'd be fine with kidney organoids. So you could kind of, you could have uh, a checklist of, am I fine with this or not? And people could check it off. And then in the data, in the, in the, in the repository, you know, I would go to the repository and I would see that, well, this cell line can't be used for brain organoids. So I won't get that one. I'll get a different one. We have some other questions about moral status and um, specifically if we were to be able to imp implement brain organoids into animal models and the vascular system would allow that to thrive. Um, one, how would you be able to know if the cognition capacity and potentially consciousness is expanded? Um, and um, so where would then that entity lie on the spectrum of moral status? I'm happy to take this on, but I'm curious about your thoughts about, you know, transfer of brain organoids into animal models. I don't think that's an area that your team works on, but there have been others who have done such work. Um, yeah, so we're not, we're not doing anything with that. We're not doing any sort of transplantations. Um, yeah, I, we're, the reason we're not doing it is not necessarily because I feel that it's ethically not okay. I actually think it's, for example, putting, putting organoids in mice, I, I think from a, maybe I can get into why that is, but I, I don't think that that's actually too, really too much of a concern. But um, the, the reason we're not doing it is just because I'd like to have a model that can, can be fully in vitro because it's just easier to do things with. You know, we're not gonna be able to do drug screening on mice with brain organoids implanted in them. So to be able to have organoids that just stay in vitro so we can do lots of different um, perturbations and really study them carefully that way, I think is better for the kinds of questions we have. But um, I mean, in terms of why I, I don't think that's a problem, I, the reason I don't think it's a problem is for mice in particular. <laughs> and, and, and for example, I might think it's more of a problem if you were to transplant brain organoids at a very, very early stage of a, of a pig embryo, for example, or a cow embryo or something like that. And that's just because of size. I, I, kept, throw, I kept driving home this point throughout my talk on purpose because I think size is really, really important here. And you just, you can't grow a hundred billion neurons in a mouse head, it just won't fit. Um, I actually calculated out so I just so just so that you understand also what we're talking about when we're having size. So I calculate out how many of our organoids we'd have to grow in order to reach 100 billion neurons. It would be 25 to 55,000 organoids. So we'd have to somehow get 55,000 organoids all growing in one giant blob in order to get enough neurons to make human-sized, you know, neurons. <laughs> Or I also calculate if we were to grow them on dishes on a on a on a tissue culture dish, you would need a tissue culture dish the size of the floor plan of my house. So you would need a hundred square meter tissue tissue culture dish to fit that many neurons. So it's really yeah. a huge number of neurons. You can do it. I believe in you. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but, um, 
Well, well, let me give a little bit of background on that question, right? So there have been teams that, at least one team that's transplanted human brain organoids into rodent uh, models. A couple of things to keep in mind here. One is that um, when you do an experiment like that, you have to justify why you're using that species, host species. And if somebody wants to jump right away to non-human primate, or as Madeline said, you know, pig or, or, or a much larger animal, the question for the research oversight people would be, what is your research question and why do you have to use that particular animal model? I can't think of a very good reason right now, uh, scientifically, of why you would jump to that kind of host and not use a rodent. If you're talking about a much smaller animal, then you run into the major limitations of physical space because what you have not only have to do is squeeze the brain organ right into the skull of the small animal, but you also have to excise out part of the brain tissue to do the replacement. Now, there's only so much you could take out before you kill the animal or greatly harm the animal to the degree that the animal research committee would not allow that kind of research. So there are these other constraints that are kind of, I think, militating against the concern that people may have about these radical models, you know, using human brain organoids. One more point to raise on this point, and that is if we did get evidence that the human brain organoid somehow contributed to anything of the animal's experience or anything of, of its abilities, it's a rescued function, the clinical implications of that are astonishing. Mm. You know, I think would greatly outweigh any concerns people may have about, gee, is the mouse having a bad experience or is it starting to you know, question its reality, right? The clinical implications of having transplantable human brain organoid to recover function is enormous for stroke victims, it's enormous for human health. Uh, so we also have to kind of keep in mind that, uh, that other narrative that would emerge from that kind of experiment. But that was a good question. Thank you. That's a really good point. And so I didn't, I didn't actually consider that one, of course. If you could actually get an organoid to contribute and integrate and, and recover, and let's say, an animal with spinal cord injury, I mean, that would have huge implications. And as, as I try to also remind a lot of people who bring up the consciousness issue as well and such, you know, there are a lot of truly conscious human beings out there who are suffering from conditions that have no good treatments. And organoids are one of these new models that can finally, I hope, provide some new treatments. It's already showing promise in, in the Zika virus. Like I said, there's already small molecules being developed. And I think it's only a matter of time, probably in the next, definitely in the next decade, we're gonna see new drugs being developed with the help of organoids. So there are a lot of questions in the chat about consciousness and um, we'll move a little bit in a different direction. We, one question that's interesting is a hypothetical, um, adult humans who have had significant parts of their brains removed can still be conscious with the plane analogy in mind, as well as the evidence of functional nerve tracts. Is it possible some arrangement of an organoid could become conscious through a randomly fortunate connection, even if not all brain regions are present or if they're arranged poorly? So that's a, that's a very interesting idea. I'd like to just quickly um, stress that uh, or like highlight the fact that in those patients that this person is referring to, those are, of course, human beings who, before having lost those parts of their brain, had the part and it was organized and they were interacting with their environment. And that is so key here that actually, first of all, developing the, the, the brain needs to have that kind of interaction with the environment, both input and output. So it's got to have receiving some sort of sensory input and having some sort of interaction with that input. So you have to have a closed circuit to make a functioning, you know, functioning neural circuit. You've got to be able to not only see the thing, but touch it, move it around. We know that, that we know from animal studies that uh, if you prevent an animal from being able to interact with something, they functionally can't see it, even though their eyes work just fine. So there's, there's that. So this, you've got to have it developing in, in a body, interacting with the world. Then, yes, okay, then if you start taking away that kind, you know, those inputs and outputs, for example, or you start taking away parts of the brain, there might be some, some um, remnant of consciousness, but to develop in the first place, it has to have, it has to have a body, it has to interact with the world. That's a terrific answer. I think that's also a really good reason why you have to have ethics and science together, because um, a lot of philosophers wouldn't, wouldn't think about that angle and those constraints. Very good, thank you. Sure, um, and let's talk a little bit about access and justice. Um, we have a question here, as far as exponential 
applications of organized, organoid research applications, how affordable accessible is organoid research to other areas around the world, especially low and middle income countries. Mm -hmm. And to that, I might add um, a question about different public or scientific attitudes towards this sort of research in the UK or the US or elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So in terms of cost, um, uh, I mean, we have, so we, there's a, there's a kit we can buy, you know, that actually we use in my lab now that's developed based on our method. Um, and it's very convenient, but it's also more expensive. Um, that's also why it's, you know, they, that tends to be right. When a company comes along and makes something really nice and convenient, they're going to charge you more for it, but you don't have to use that kit. You can also make your own homemade media using, um, uh, all the basil, we, we publish the recipe for it. You can buy all the components and make it yourself. And we calculate it out when you do it your home, when you make it homemade. Um, I think we calculated that to grow an organoid from start to sort of the stage when you might want to do some different analyses was about a dollar. So it's not actually that expensive to make an organoid. Um, we don't usually make just one. So we usually make, you know, like 25 or 50 or something at a time so that we can compare across lots of different organoids and stuff. But still 25 or 50 at a time, 25 or $50, that's really not too bad, I think. So I do think it's affordable. Um, what becomes more expensive is actually the stem cells, maintaining the stem cells, but that's, that's, that's just stem cells. So we can't do much about that. The, the organoids have to be made from stem cells, so. Uh, I don't know, Insu, do you have other questions that may... There was another question you asked at the end. Maybe Insu can also comment oh, on right, that. Right, about like attitudes about organoid research, UK versus US, for example, just to take two, two locales. Do you see differences? Yes, I definitely see differences. So, I mean, I'm American. I, I did my, um, my undergrad and my graduate work in the US, in California, and I did my... Um, postdoc in Austria. And then of course, now I have my lab here. So I've seen, yeah, I've been in three different countries and experienced different attitudes. And I can, I can tell you that I've seen quite, quite different attitudes across the three. So for example, in Austria, they're highly conservative when it comes to stem cell research. And I think organoids are sort of viewed in the same kind of way as, as, as stem cell research. Generally, they, they're kind of kind of lumped in together with that, even though they come with their own sort of ethical things. But um, the, the, it sort of starts from the stem cells. And in Austria, they're very conservative when it comes to stem cell research. Um, so, you know, we had to be sort of careful just with, with how we communicated our work and um, kind of emphasizing the, the fact that a lot of it, we mainly use iPS cells, so induced pluripotent stem cells and not so much embryonic stem cells. Um, and instead in the UK, it's sort of the opposite. And then sort of the United States is kind of in the middle, I'd say. So in the UK, actually the, the attitudes towards stem cell research and, and also sort of by, uh, um, extension organoid research is more, um, uh, progressive, I guess. So they, they're, they're really not too concerned, you know, here, for example, you can use public funding to generate new embryonic stem cell lines from blastocysts. You can work with human embryos and do experiments on human embryos up until day 14, obviously the day 14. And I think the UK was one of the first countries to allow genetic engineering of human embryos for research purposes. Uh, whereas in the United States, that work would not, would not is not yet allowed. Um, and I think it's, uh, or at least not with public funding. So um, I think that they are more, uh, I guess, progressive on that front, but where they are more conservative in the UK is actually animal research. So they're much more conservative when it comes to, um, you know, limiting animal research. It, it took me a very long time to get a license to do any work with animals. And actually in the end, we didn't, we just don't do any work with animals in the end. Um, and and I, I have to say, I, I think I like that. I, I, I'm kind of, I myself am more concerned about the consciousness of a mouse that you know I might work with than I am about the brain organized that I have in the dish. 
Mel, let me have a follow, ask a follow-up question. I thought it was really fascinating what you're seeing in the developmental differences between the great ape, organoids, and human. I'm wondering um, if you were to do the similar kind of analysis of other non-human primates that are actually used in biomedical research, neurological research, uh, and if you were to uncover some key differences there, wouldn't that be a way for those who are actually, you know, pretty hesitant about non-human primate research, invasive for neurological studies to, to say, you know, are these really the, as informative models as we thought they would be for human conditions? I, I can imagine some sort of, um, you know, route to, to, to being a little bit more skeptical about the scientific usefulness and justification for using non-human primates for neurological studies, because the assumption seems to be, well, they're very, they're the closest thing we have to man that we can actually use, uh, you know, practically and legally. But it might be that actually, maybe that's not that warranted. There are some key differences there, and maybe brain organoids might be kind of a way to either be an alternative to using non-human primates themselves for this kind of work. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, we are only so we're only now really getting into other so like macaque for example mm -hmm. um uh which is used for and and also the so the, the, the two two different macaque species that people use for non-human primate research um and we have cell lines for those and we've started making organoids and um what so you know we've also we also make mouse organoids too and um what you see is that the non-human primate, so that the monkey organoids basically, are sort of somewhere in between uh, in terms of the many sort of readouts that we use between rodents and humans. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that um, now it depends on the feature. So, so we're generally looking at these kinds of early events that I talked about. And, and we see that in mice, so for example, in mouse organoids, this transition that I talked about, I mean, we can't even catch it. It's so fast. It happens in a matter of hours. And in, in the non-human um, apes and, the, and, and humans, so basically in the apes, um, this transition, transition takes you know, about a week. And in the macaque, for example, it's sort of somewhere in between. It looks like it takes a couple of days. So meaning that they are closer to humans and so they may still, be, and this is just one feature we've looked at, but if this is true sort of across the board, then organoids may tell us that, well, they may confirm that they're closer to humans. So meaning there are probably some things that we will still wanna do in macaques. But if, they are, if there are things that you can do in an organoid, then absolutely, I mean, we should do it in an organoid. But I, unfortunately I don't, I think we just don't really know everything that organoids can do yet. So, and that's also part of what we're doing in my lab, just trying to characterize everything that they can model. I have one last question and I don't come from a scientific background, but um, as you see these lobes that are growing in you and how much control are you being able to get in directing what type of cell, what type of lobe, what type of area? Yeah, um, that's so a that good question. That's a very, very good question. I mean, that's one that, that my scientific colleagues always ask me. So it's a very good one. Um, the, the, the original, when we originally developed this protocol, we really had no control. I mean, every lobe developed to be something different. It was, it was very messy, really. Um, but since then, I mean, that was, that was, well, seven years ago now, um, we've steadily been, you know, improving the method that we use and others too. I mean, I want to emphasize this is a, this is a big field. I'm one player, player in this very big field now that's, that's, that's been reaching all across the globe, really. And so others too have been, you know, mod modifying the protocol and, you know, using different factors to help control it a little bit better. And it's a little bit of a, of a sort of um, give and take. So you, you kind of, if you, if you push it too far, so if you try to control it too much, you start overriding the intrinsic um, developmental programs. And then you start losing some of the, the, the actual development and, and, you know, then you, you're not able to watch processes that would happen normally in vivo because you've completely over, overrided them. But I think we're reaching a balance now where we're able to kind of gently 
help guide it. And I can tell you that, that all of those lobes that I showed, they are all cortex. We know because we can, we can look at later stages and we can use different markers and see that we know for sure we're getting cortex. Um, but, um, and, and, and we're able to still maintain the, the intrinsic sort of developmental programs there uh, in that way. Great. Um, cognizant of the time, I just wanted to point out that there are many people who would love to hear your ideas of what consciousness might look like or how it might need to be redefined. Um, so if you do decide to broach that topic, and I'm not going to pin you to it now, you started saying that we weren't going to go down that road, but many people would love to hear your thoughts on that down the road. Yeah, but why don't you just take us down the home stretch on this? <laughs> yeah, sure. I can, I mean, I'm Red happy to. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, you, you asked me into sort of before this, what would it take to have a conscious brain organ, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good, that's a good way to start from. So consciousness, we may not be able to define, but I, but I can at least, I think there's, we have enough information from neuroscience to tell us, regardless of how we define it, what are some of the uh, prerequisites to get that? And one is size. I kept going on and on about size. I think it's about size. Now, you could have, let's say, a human brain organoid that has the same number of neurons as a, a fish, which would still be a huge number of neurons and way more than what we currently have. But then, you know, maximally, it would, in what I would say, is probably have the consciousness of a fish, which is probably not as advanced as ours. Um, but even then, even if you've got this large number of neurons, it's also got to be organized. So we don't have 100 billion neurons just like randomly thrown in there and connected randomly. It has to be organized in a particular way. You've got to have the two cerebral hemispheres, the thalamus, I talked about that, right? All mammalian brains have that structure. So if we don't have that structure, if we have seven cerebral cortices and no thalamus and I don't know, a random cerebellar tissue growing on there, that's not gonna have the right architecture and organization. And finally, I think you've got to have, you've got to have it develop with the interaction with the environment. You've got to have sensory input and output, and it's got to be in a way that's rich, not just, you know, I poke it and it randomly twitches because, you know, even sea slugs can do that. You poke a sea slug and it'll like pull back. That's not consciousness. And so it's got to be very, a very rich interaction with its environment. And really, I mean, you get that when you're in a body. <laughs> so um, the fact that it's completely bodiless is very small in terms of the number of neurons and is not organized tells me that we are very far away from human consciousness, um, whatever that is, but I think that we're, we're very far away from it. If you wanted to get that, getting all of those things in combination, if you could do that, then yeah, I would say, yeah, you're gonna have a conscious brain organoid. What, what, what if, do you think it would be possible to uh, not go that far, but try to model pain, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so so, um, so connect nerves to the brain organoid and try to see if there's any kind of way of setting pain pathways. Would that be yeah. possible? I think it might be possible. I mean, you can certainly, for example, um, we we hooked it up to, you know, mouse spinal cord. And uh, if you went the other way and sort of hooked it up to mouse skin, for example, and had the, the peripheral nervous system there with the pain sensors, because of course there's no pain sensors in the brain. So the brain organoid won't have any pain sensors in and of itself. But if you had it, you know, hooked up to the peripheral nervous system with pain sensors, yeah, I think you probably could. Now, what do you mean by pain? That's another point. Because what we mean by pain, I think it's not just the actual what's what's called in, in neuroscience a noxious stimulus, which is just a stimulus that's bad, but it's the emotional aspect of it that you know this this much more complex uh, aspect of pain. And I don't think that would be present in organoids. Well, that's terrific. I think uh, I want to wrap it up there. I, 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 I appreciated your uh, response to the consciousness issue because that looms very large over this field for non-scientists. So thank you so much for your thoughts on that. So I'm going to uh, conclude now our session. I want to uh, alert everybody to the fact that uh, on December 11th, we have our last consortium for the semester, which is on right to try laws and their impact on research and patient access. And for that, we have uh, George Daly, who's the Dean of the Harvard Medical School, alongside Allison Bateman House from NYU. So that's December 11th. 
And then we have four very exciting talks next semester as well. So be on the lookout for those. Um, I would like to thank our guest, Dr. Madeline Lancaster for joining us all the way in the UK. I wanna also thank my uh, graduate student, Christina Larson for fielding the questions, for Ashley Troutman and Angela Alberti for all the logistics for this program. And on behalf of the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School, I wanna thank you, the audience for joining us. I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you.